We welcome you in the name of Jesus to worship here at the Presbyterian Church of Morristown. We're here together on World Communion Sunday, so we encourage that all who put their trust in Jesus are invited to partake in communion. We ask that if you have bread, crackers, something to drink, have them prepared for later in the service when we will eat the bread and drink the cup together, remembering that we are celebrating communion with Christians throughout the world this morning. In a sad announcement, Hal Crossway died this week. Our prayers are for his wife, Carolyn, for his family, and also for Sarah Green, our associate pastor. Information about arrangements will be coming to us shortly. Will you join me now in the call to worship? Lord Christ, open our eyes. To see clearly the light of the world. Holy Spirit, illumine our minds. To perceive God's glory shining among us. Almighty God, prepare our hearts. To see, to trust, to worship the Messiah.
Please join me for our unison prayer of confession, followed by the Kyrie and a time for silent prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us to worship and to serve you only. Yet when other things demand our attention, we stray from the path Jesus trod. We serve powers that privilege the comfort of some over the well-being of many. We serve a culture that values competition over collaboration. We serve our own desires without considering the needs of our neighbors. Forgive us, Lord. Send your spirit to guide us back to you that we might respond to the grace we know in Christ and follow the ways of justice and righteousness. Amen. Please join me now in our responsive assurance of pardon. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Good morning. We all have rules to follow, don't we? You have to hold hands when you cross the street. You have to do your homework before you can go outside and play. No throwing balls in the house. We have rules at home, we have rules at school, and we have rules outside in the world. But there are also some very special rules that God made for us. We've been traveling with the Israelites and Moses, and they have now come to a place called Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is a giant mountain, and it was covered in a cloud of smoke. And God's voice came through like thunder, and it called down to Moses 
to come up to the mountaintop to talk to God. And so Moses went up there, and while he was up there, God gave him some rules for all of us to live by. Put God first. Do not worship other gods. Respect God's name. Keep a day to rest and pray. Listen to your mother and father. Do not hurt anyone. Mothers and fathers must love each other. Do not take anything without asking. Always tell the truth and be thankful for everything that you have. Then God gave Moses two stone tablets with all of the rules etched in them to carry back down to the people and share with them. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the stories that you tell us so that we can remember to always love you and do what is right. Help us to follow your commandments and love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In honor of World Communion Sunday, our second scripture reading for today, Exodus 20, will be read in multiple different languages of the world. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And this is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Du sollst dir kein Gottesbild machen und keine Darstellung von irgendetwas am Himmel droben, auf der Erde unten oder im Wasser unter der Erde. Du sollst dich nicht vor anderen Göttern niederwerfen und dich nicht verpflichten, ihnen zu dienen. Denn ich, der Herr, dein Gott, bin ein eifersüchtiger Gott. Bei denen, die mir Feind sind, verfolge ich die Schuld der Väter an den Söhnen, an der dritten und vierten Generation. Bei denen, die mich lieben und auf meine Gebote achten, erweise ich Tausenden meine Huld. No pronunciarás en vano el nombre del Señor tu Dios, porque Él no dejará sin castigo al que lo pronuncie en vano. Lembre-te do dia do sábado para o santificar. Seis dias trabalharás e farás toda a tua obra, mas o sétimo dia é o sábado do Senhor teu Deus. Não farás nenhuma obra, nem tu, nem teu filho, nem tua filha, nem o teu servo, Nem a tua serva, nem o teu animal, nem o teu estrangeiro que está dentro das tuas portas. Porque em seis dias fez o Senhor os céus e a terra, o mar e tudo que neles há, e ao sétimo dia descansou. Portanto, abençoou o Senhor o dia do sábado e o santificou. Honore ton père e ta mère, afin que tes jours se prolongem no país que l'Eternel, ton Dieu, te donne. Nieu bivai. Не прелюбодействуй, не кради, не произноси ложного свидетельства на ближнего твоего. Мтан там ли е цу би е цу, я мтан там ли е цу би е бо, ло бо, лу би, гу, лу, и ки ли е цу би и це со уе. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. 
The story goes that Franklin Delano Roosevelt died and went to heaven. There he met Moses at the pearly gates. Moses said, are you Franklin Roosevelt who was the president? And he said, yes. And you're the one who wrote the four freedoms? And he said, yes. And Moses said, I'm sorry, no one's listening to them. To which Roosevelt said, that's okay, Moses, your 10 commandments aren't doing so well either. I think when I wake up in the middle of the night right now, it's a dark time. It's not just COVID, it's what's going on in the world. And at these times, it's sometimes hard to believe that some scripture which comes from 1300 years before Jesus would have anything to say to the darkness we face. Let's face it, we're not listening to one another. We talk over one another. We're sure that the other side is wrong and that we can't cooperate. And then we are concerned about this pandemic, which is all over the world, and we wonder what it's gonna be like on the other side. Does a scripture like the Ten Commandments have anything to say to the darkness we feel today? And I would share with you, it has everything to say. The Ten Commandments are God's gift, not just to the people of Israel, but to all of us and at all times. I wanna talk about three things when it comes to the Ten Commandments. The first is what I've said, it's a gift from God to us. The second, it's a roadmap to the way in which the world operates. And the third is that it's not the end of morality, it's the beginning. Now, how is it a gift? When I was in confirmation class many, many years ago, we had to memorize pieces of scripture. So I had to memorize the Ten Commandments. And believe me, the second commandment's hard with all the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. But what I didn't understand is there's a preamble. It starts with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the covenant. This is the center of the Hebrew Bible. This is where it starts and everything else radiates from it. You see, the gift is that God gave the people of Israel freedom. And we've talked about the story through Passover. We've talked about going through the sea, into the wilderness, being fed, and eventually getting water. But what God is doing is he's taking these people who are slaves out of slavery and taking them to something, to a mountain, the place where he had called Moses long before, the place where he had revealed his name to Moses, and he told the people of Israel, you're to go there and worship me and there I will give you a gift. And it's the 10 commandments. And though it's old and the words are sometimes hard to understand, they are a gift from God, a covenant. We make covenants all the time. If you happen to be married, you made a covenant with another person. If you have a credit card or a mortgage, it's a covenant that someone will do something for you and you will respond. This covenant means that God set the people free to make a decision. What does he want on the other end? Simply this, he wants us to live moral, kind, compassionate, loving lives. And in doing so, it's his gift to us about how we could be happy in the future. And it's one that has guided people at every dark time in history. The second thing it is, it's a roadmap. It tells you how God's world operates. There's a story that Mark Twain used to tell. He was having a conversation with a unscrupulous uh, uh, financier. And the man eventually said that at the end of my life, I'm going to go to the Holy Land and I'm going to find Mount Sinai and I'm going to climb to the top. And when I get to the top, I am going to proclaim the Ten Commandments for all the world to hear. To which Twain said, I have a better idea. Why don't you stay in Boston and live them? What God is asking is, could you at least do this? The Ten Commandments are divided into two parts, and Jesus shares that when he was questioned by authorities. They asked him what was the greatest of the commandments, and he said there are two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He said all the law and the prophets came down to those two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor. 
Alexandra just showed us the two tablets and that's how the people of Israel saw it. On the one tablet, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. No other gods, no graven images. Remember that his name is sacred, worship him. And finally, the last of those fives has to do with the authority that we encounter with God, that the authority that we encounter with parents is not unlike the authority we have with God. I talked about that last week. The second of these is to love your neighbor as yourself. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet your neighbor's Mercedes. Just don't do that. In doing so, it's the least we can do in dealing with the darkness that we encounter in life. It's truly important that we understand this because in our lives, God is saying, if you make your life about me, if I am central, if you love me with your heart and mind, you'll understand this world I have created. And if you do, then at least follow these in the way in which you relate to the people around you, even if they don't look like you, talk like you, love like you, believe like you. They're all God's children, just like you. It's the least we could do. And when you come to those, of course, there are gonna be questions about, well, what does he mean by kill? Well, if something is killed, there are repercussions. In the adultery commandment, it is simply this. If you've made a commitment to another person in marriage, if you break it, you can't love another person that way as well, it all blows up. If you take someone else's property, how are we going to live together? If you lie, we lose the truth. And if you spend your life wanting what everybody else has, you will never be content and you'll be miserable. It's a roadmap to the way the world is. That's why it's a gift. He's saying at least do this. And if you do this, you'll be able to live a happier life. Which brings me to the third part. The third part is it's a beginning. There's a section of Deuteronomy, which is the last book in the Torah, where God is addressing the people and talking about how important this is. He says, oh, that the people might have this heart about them, that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. And if they did, then all would be well with them and with their children forever. That lament is to remind us that the Ten Commandments are the beginning of morality, not the end. If you're patting yourself on the back because you didn't commit adultery this week, you missed the point. One of the problems that happened in the discovery of the Ten Commandments and eventually the interpretation is that scholars were trying to parse them so they could prove their own righteousness. Jesus tore that apart in the Sermon on the Mount, what he says is not that he's replacing it, but he's interpreting it. So that if the person says that he didn't kill anybody today, aren't I a great guy? Jesus is saying, did you talk over somebody? Did you show rage? Toward, did you call somebody you fool? If you did, you've broken that commandment in your heart. And if you're saying, well, geez, I was faithful to my wife or husband this week, he says, if you had lust in your heart at any time this week, you've committed adultery in your heart. When I shared that with a bunch of teenagers years ago with my youth group, one boy said to me, Reverend, if that's true, boy, am I in trouble. And aren't we all? Jesus is saying to us that if you lie to somebody, if you throw lies and don't tell the truth, there's no way we can talk, we can debate, we can do anything. And if I'm spending my life wanting somebody else's life because the grass is greener over on his lawn, I will be miserable my whole life. This isn't the end of morality, it's the beginning and God is saying at least do this. What Jesus is, is the new covenant. When we break the bread together and as we share the cup, we're reminded that Jesus is the embodiment of this covenant. And that what he does is he tells us to treat each other with love, 
with concern and kindness, all those things we are in such need of today. That if your neighbor has a different political sign outside of his house, have a conversation with him, but listen to him and pray that he will listen to you. If someone is in need, treat that person as if he were your neighbor. And when you're making decisions about the values of your life, remember that Jesus is saying to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That puts money, success in a different order. The Ten Commandments are a gift. They are a roadmap. And ultimately, they're the beginning, not the end of morality. In 1930, the world was in a dark place. In America, it was a year after the stock market crashed, and a lot of people didn't know whether Herbert Hoover knew what he was doing. In Europe at that time, Mussolini and Hitler were rising to power along with the fascists. The 1930s may have been one of the darkest decades in the history of humankind. It would lead eventually, obviously, to World War II, probably the worst six years in all history. At the time, America was an isolationist country and Britain was trying to appease Hitler. What lay ahead was horrible. In 1930, in Shadyside, Pennsylvania, Hugh Thompson Kerr, who was the pastor there, got this idea. Why not on the first Sunday of October remember that Christians throughout the world, even this world being torn apart, could celebrate communion together? And he initiated worldwide communion. It took. And during the 1930s, that dark, dark decade, it began to become part of other denominations so that by 1940, in the middle of World War II, the National Council of Churches adopted it. And since then, we have been celebrating World Communion on this Sunday every year. When we break bread together, we're doing it with Christians throughout the year, world. But what's happening today is it's the first time in history that we are doing this global communion in the middle of a global virus. That in the darkness as it brings to us and the fears we have about that, the light is Jesus Christ which binds us together. He's the embodiment of the law of God, the grace of God, and in eating the bread and drinking the cup with other Christians, we know there's a future. There is a light. The Ten Commandments have everything to do with us today. They are a gift, they are a roadmap, and they are a beginning. Last week in the benediction, I talked about another dark time, 1968. I was in college. I talked about the death of Martin Luther King. It got worse. It was almost exactly two months after King died, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. He was my hero. I wanted him to be president. And I remember just sitting there getting the news thinking, what's happening to America? We will never get out of this darkness. Then at his funeral, I got to listen to the eulogy by his brother, Ted. And I'll never forget the quote he had at the end of it because I'd never really thought about the quote before. It comes from George Bernard Shaw. It's what Bobby Kennedy would say at many of his campaign stops. It went like this. Some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream dreams that never were and ask why not. Why, God, is it so dark? And he answers, why not love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Why not love your neighbor as yourself? Because if we do, then God's lament will be for us as well. Why can't they have a heart about them? That they would fear me, but keep my commandments always. Because if they did, all would be well with them and with their children forever. Why not that? Amen. Hi everyone, I'm Debbie McKenna, the Events and Volunteer Coordinator at the Market Street Mission. This year on Saturday, November 7th, the Market Street Mission will be sponsoring its annual coat giveaway in the Morristown Town Hall parking lot. 
from 10 to 1 p.m. This is a free event. And over the past 30 years, we have partnered with the Presbyterian Church of Morristown to collect coats for those in need in our community. Once again, we're seeking your support for collecting uh, new or slightly used coats for men, women, or children. Uh, we're also looking for extra large coats as well. Hats, gloves, and scarves for men and children as well. You may drop off your uh, coats and items at the Parish House at 65 South Street between Monday and Thursday, 9 to 3 p.m. The last day to drop off those coats and items is Wednesday, October 21st. Thank you for your support over these many years, and we look forward to a successful year. Thanks again. On this World Communion Sunday, we need to remember that Christians throughout the world are breaking bread and sharing in the cup today. Also, we're doing this virtually, so I would encourage you to be in a place where you have either bread or crackers nearby and something to drink so that you can participate with us as we share in the bread and in the cup. I'll also say that today I will be sharing communion as I have with my congregations over the years, so it's not the way you have here at Morristown. Maybe that's a reminder that people do it in different ways, but we still are celebrating the gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. All who put their trust in Jesus are invited and encouraged to partake of this, his holy table. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth his death until he comes again. Men and women will come from the north and the south and the east and the west to partake of this, his holy table. And as we break bread together, we are reminded that we break it with people who believe throughout the world. Let us pray. Mighty and everlasting God, we come to this table in awe. It is a celebration of the gift of your son. And we are overwhelmed that we celebrate it with people throughout the world. We'd ask that you'd separate these elements from a common to a sacred use that we might be reminded that in this world, when you wanted to redeem us and show your love to us and embody these commandments, you came in person. We thank you for the gift of Jesus in his life, his death, his resurrection, in the words he taught, in the way in which he helped us understand what these commandments mean. May we follow them just as we follow him. And may this communion this celebration, this sacrament, be a reminder of your love, how profound that is for us today and forever. We offer this in his name, amen. And Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth his death until he comes again. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has long served us and loved us, who has searched after us and cares for us, we thank you for this joyous feast, a reminder of your love for us and the gift of Jesus. Be with us now as we taste and as we remember all that you have done for them and for us, that even as you brought them out of slavery through the sea, 
through the wilderness to the mountain. You showed them the way we are to live, morally, kindly, lovingly, and to put you at the center of our lives. May we remember also that we're not alone in this, that we celebrate this with Christians throughout the world, even in this time when we are afraid of a virus. May we be remembering that gift, that hope, and our future. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn that you just heard that was sung by Matt was written by Hugh Thompson Kerr on the 50th anniversary of the Shadyside Presbyterian Church. Remember, Hugh Thompson Kerr was the one who came up with the idea World Communion Sunday. It's a beautiful hymn about God who is in our lives and in the future as well. You see, the Ten Commandments were given to us as a gift, hope for us at every age, in every dark time, 
that if we at least love the Lord our God with our whole heart, and if we at least love our neighbor as ourselves, it's a start. And it's a way in which we can know we're on the right path towards what God hopes for us. Lives that are moral, kind, compassionate, empathetic, and loving. So go in peace, be of good courage, and follow our Lord Jesus Christ if you dare. Amen.